I'm Anthony Scaramucci, and welcome to Open Book, where I talk with some of the most interesting and brilliant minds in our world today. For joining us now on Open Book is Jonathan Carl. He's a best-selling author, uh, but he's also an amazing television host. He's the chief Washington correspondent for ABC News. And here's the book, Tired of Winning, uh, which I read the book. I read your other book, too. Your other book was a little bit more painful because, unfortunately, I was in the other book. <laughs> this book is a lot less painful for me, John. Yeah, yeah. But, but first of all, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, before I get into the book, I'm dying to ask you a question, sure. uh, which I've actually been dying to ask you for like the last uh, uh, six or seven years. Okay, so you ready? Yep, the first, I'm ready. The first question that I... Uh, I purposefully asked the CNN correspondent the first question in the Brady press room. So the the afternoon that I got my job and uh, Priebus was trying to stop me from getting it, Bannon Bar- yeah. was stabbing me in the back all night. Yeah. Uh, uh, Sean Spicer resigned from his job in protest. Uh, but I went to CNN first because they had not been called on in about three months. You may recall that. So yep. purposefully I did that. My my second question was to you. Do you remember what you asked me? Um, yeah, I, I I think I asked you about something horrible you had said about Trump. Yes, exactly. So you you, you <laughs> sorry. Listed. I mean, I was just I was you know I was no, just kinda... fantastic. This is why this is a great podcast. So you <laughs> you proceeded to list the things that I said about him. I said he was uh, the president of the Queens Bully Association, and yes, I yes. had some great lines that I, when I was zipping Trump working for yeah, Bush. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and uh, don't worry, this is an audio <laughs> podcast, so nobody can see the shade of red that you're going, Jonathan Carl. So that's fine. But you were ripping into me at the podium, and I'm a big yeah. boy, so I took it and I yeah, yeah. tried to flip it and spin it. And uh, but I think you what, thanked me for for reminding everybody of I did. Of the thing I did. Said, I said yeah. I'm glad you got that out there because <laughs> rather than having to hear that every day in the office, yeah. well, of course, I didn't realize I was only going to stay for 11 days, but. We got it out of the way. But the question I'm dying to ask you, because you've been around Washington and journalism a long time and you know the nature of the people. Um, It wasn't just me. There was a very large group of people, Mike Pompeo, Ted Cruz, Kellyanne Conway. Um, We could find tapes of, I would say, 50 people that worked in the Trump administration that said nasty things about Donald Trump prior to working in the administration. Uh, and then yet all of them went into the administration. Some of them came out of the administration not saying anything, but a lot of them returned to the nastiness, myself included. Yep. And so I want to ask you this before we get into your book. Um, why did it manifest like that? What is it about human nature, behavior in Washington? What is it about guys like Kevin McCarthy who absolutely hated Donald Trump and could have put him away lights out on January 7th of 2021, uh, but but feared him. And now because of his lack of uh, backbone, he lost the speakership and and he wasn't able to corral his troops. So, so you tell me, what is it about people? And by the way, it doesn't reflect well on me, right? Because I had an yeah. opinion of him and I said, OK, I sucked it up. And team player went to go work for him. But it was the wrong thing for many of us to do. Why do you think people do that? Well, I think there are there are a variety of reasons, and this what I'm about to say probably does not apply to you. I'm rather certain it wouldn't, but I think that for for a lot of people, the ones who work for him, um, and the ones who totally flipped when when they did, is there was something about getting inside his orbit and the way he, you know, Trump is a guy that can make you feel like you are the king of the world in one moment, and the very next next moment make you feel like you are crap and nothing, and worse than nothing, less than nothing. But that he does ha- undoubtedly have that magnetism, and with with the with the elected officials, I've seen it where they, you know, they they, they appear at a public event with Trump, they appear at a rally with Trump, and they've never seen a crowd like that before, um, as riled up and as fired up and as responsive to what they're saying when they're saying something in praise of the dear leader. Um, and, and I, you know, I, I saw that over and over again. I mean, I saw, you know, Chuck Grassley for God's sake, um, at a, at a rally, you remember there was like a brief, like five minutes where it looked like Grassley was going to have a, uh, potentially a tough reelection, a uh, race in 2022. 
and Trump goes out to uh, Sioux City, not Sioux Falls, by the way, Sioux City. And, um, and you know, there's Grassley and, and Grassley's been senator, you know, for, you know, for a half century. No, he's like, he's like for, for viewers <laughs> that don't know who John is talking about, he's George Washington's grandfather. He's 700 <laughs> years old. Yeah. And he's been in the you Senate know, for like eight. 800 yeah. of the 700 years, right? We both and, know and, that. And right? he's, he's like, yeah. he's, I mean, the guy's a farmer and he's been, he's been elected over and over and over and over and over again. And, 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 and he's, you know, he's, he makes, he makes Joe Biden look like a young man. Um, but, but for him to walk out on that stage with, with Trump, I mean, suddenly, and Grassley's not a Trump guy at all. Right. Uh, but you know, there it is. And suddenly he's right. praising. Yeah, I the, that, you uh, know, so I, yeah, I have my own view. I think that, you know, for me, and by the way, my wife hates Trump almost as much as Melania hates him. So, you know, that's a very high standard of hatred. And <laughs> wow, got that me. is something, man. Yeah, that is something. It almost got me yeah. divorced. Uh, and But I did it for ego-based reasons, ultimately. So if I'm, if I'm being honest, again, doesn't reflect well on me. And I had this conversation with Robert Greene, uh, who was on our show about three months ago, celebrating the 25th anniversary of the 48 Laws of Power. Uh, a lot of it's ego based, unfortunately. And so so we're here now. This is a great book, Tired of Winning. It it picks up from where betrayal ended. And by the way, this would be a phenomenal mini series. I don't know if that's something in the works or not, because both these books are uh, they read as uh, political thrillers would read. You want to turn the page to the next page, even though I know the story, you are providing insight that none of us actually saw even when we were on the ground. Um, did you think that Donald Trump would end up consuming this much of your time back when you were covering him? You know, I mean, absolutely not. And, and remember, I, I had covered him when I was a New York Post reporter in the 1990s. Uh, you know, I mean, he, he was the kind of guy you could call on a slow news day, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and hey, what do you think of something? And you get some kind of a story. He was always willing to play ball, but, um, never really took him particularly serious, except as kind of, uh, you know, an entertaining sideshow. Um, so I, I certainly didn't think that. And then as I was covering his campaign and I did the first network interview with him of the 2016 cycle, I did the interview actually in 2013, August of 2013, when he made, uh, uh, you know, a trip to Iowa and he spoke at the, the, the leader conference with, you know, I think it was Vander Plaats and that whole, that whole crowd of evangelicals was not particularly well received at that point. Ted Cruz was the, you know, seemed to be the guy. But I did an interview with him out there and, and you know, and, and, I, and we I remember we, we were trying to figure out, should we do the interview? And if we do, where do we put it in the show? And, you know, we, we ended up doing it for five minutes in the second half of the show. This is our Sunday show, you know, this week. And it was a slow August. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I did not think that, that this was going to be anything like this that, you know, I mean, frankly, I didn't think he was going to end up at the White House. But then. You know, when I wrote Betrayal, I, I really felt that would be the last thing I would ever write about Donald Trump. Um, but you, you, there's so much to write. I mean, yeah. I mean, this is this is such a colorful story. There's a, a Greek tragedy in this story. Yep. Um, uh, is a is America, and I mean the nation, is the is America a protagonist in this story and. And what I what I mean by that is, uh, uh, are we tired of winning? Are are we going to defeat Donald Trump uh, in two thousand and twenty four? Uh, I mean, I this is this is something I address in in the book um, as I try to conclude after I tell the story of of Trump's final weeks in office because there was so much information that that, that has come out. And that I was able to learn beyond what I had done even in betrayal, you know, part of it, all the sworn testimony from the January 6th committee that had not seen light. I mean, still, this is the first time a lot of that stuff had seen light, but also those, what I call the dark days in Mar-a-Lago when I guess now we, we hear from Liz Cheney, Kevin wasn't, I mean, you know, he, Kevin was concerned that, uh, that Trump wasn't even eating, <laughs> uh, but, but he was a, a depressed mess, uh, who found, um, some solace in becoming a uh, an amateur DJ on the patio there at uh, at Mar-a-Lago. This did not seem like a guy uh, that was in in any way uh, making a comeback. Um, but 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 the question is, you know, if why the appeal? Why did he he come back? 
is it real? I mean, I go through at some length how the Republican Party and Donald Trump himself have actually been doing nothing but losing since 2016. I mean, all the, you know, the, the, the off-year elections, the midterm elections, the special elections, the runoff elections, where Republicans close to Trump either have just simply lost or wildly un- underperformed. Uh, and where Trump himself obviously lost in 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 2020 and and didn't just lose the the election I mean and, and and the massive loss in the popular vote which was much greater than the loss in the electoral college but all those losses in court the all those losses in his efforts to try to get Congress to to overturn the results his failed attempt to get his vice president to do something his failed to attempt to pressure local re- Republicans in Georgia and Arizona and 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 Michigan and Pennsylvania uh, to do something. I mean, this guy's. I mean, Anthony. I I had been. I had. A, I had a working title for this book when I first started uh, working on it, which was the biggest loser. Um, but then something really strange happened. Uh, he ends up becoming once again the dominant figure in the Republican Party while I'm working on this book. And and so that's the big question: well, it, well, Is America see, tired of this kind of of, of winning? That's I'm, the question. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm trying to figure it out myself. I mean, when I finished your book, I you know one of the things I take pride in on open book is I I read the book that the author uh, writes because it's important for me. This way, I can have a real conversation with you. When I finished your book, I closed the book. Uh, the first thing that came to mind for me, and correct me if I'm wrong, he's he's actually Al Capone. Uh, and let me let me explain why it feels like he's not going to get caught. If you remember the movie, The Untouchables, Mr. Capone was an untouchable. Uh, John Gotti, who I grew up with, uh, his kids who out here, uh, you know, on Long Island. I mean, I'm talking to you from the city, but they're all from Long Island. I know John Jr. Uh, the father was perceived to be Teflon Don. He was never going to be going to jail. He died in jail. And I guess my question to you, after reading the evidentiary information that you're providing in this book about the culpability of Donald Trump in so many different forms, and I just remind viewers and listeners, there are four uh, grand jury indictments, 91 counts of uh, accusations of being made against him. And yes, there's 20 percent of the people that still like him. But is the government going to bring him down in 2024? Or is this mystery that the media talks about that he is the te- the true Teflon Don? I, I, I think that he I think your, your 20 percent, by the way, is uh, is is the key thing to focus on. Um, th- there is about 20 percent of the country. That might even be a generous number that, that is right. totally 15. and completely. Right. Uh, yeah. With him, this is the shoot him on Fifth Avenue crowd. Uh, yes, no I'm, question. You know, yeah, we agree. Uh, um, but but there but there's a much bigger group that perhaps you know got completely sick of all things Donald Trump, um, and when he left, kind of stopped paying attention to him, and now we're back. We're approaching another another election, and there's kind of a superficial. Am I better off now than I was four years ago? Kind of feeling. Um, and you know, people think back to 2019, you know, um, uh, Donald Trump was president. The world looked a lot more peaceful. Uh, inflation was low. The economy felt pretty good. Um, and so I think, I think, I think that a lot of it is like an appeal to that and they haven't really paid any attention to, first of all, memories have faded of, of what happened in 2020 and early 2021. And and people haven't focused on what the guy actually stands for, especially now, which I think is a darker, a darker Donald Trump than we saw even in the American carnage days. Um, um, and even, you know, when, when you were uh, at the White House, I think this is a mm-hmm. this is why I wrote the book. I mean, this is really why I wrote the book is I wanted to, to have a very concise and powerful statement and, and presentation of facts, including a lot of new reporting about what it was really like at the end of that presidency and what it could be like now based on, you know, how, how he has evolved and most importantly, the people so, that have fled him. Um, so, uh, you know, look, I, 
I, I, I think there's still, I'm, I'm one of the few people out there that still thinks there's a chance he could lose the Republican nomination. Mm-hmm. Um, that may be a slimmer and slimmer chance as, as we get closer to Iowa, but I don't think that's impossible. And, and I, and I, I, I don't think that there's a mass movement out there to, to, uh, you know, to bring back Donald Trump to power. Okay. Another observation from your book. I think, you know, I feel like if Huey Long had a baby with Charles Lindbergh, and the baby was born and adopted by Roy Cohn, that would be Donald Trump. Okay, so you have this uh, manifestation of isolationist tendencies, manifestation of white supremacy. Uh, he is a descendant of the first America First movement. Yep. Uh, and then he has that sort of evilness that Roy had, uh, which we all remember uh, living here in New York, how treacherous Roy Cohn was. Um, I guess my question, and this my, this is an observation, did he make the Republican Party and remold it in his image, or was the clay already out there, uh, and they they drew to him once he started spitting his invective? There are a lot of people that have made the argument that the clay was out there. Uh, Dana Milbank uh, wrote, wrote a whole book about this, like you know the. Uh, Looking at, at at the Republican Party laying the groundwork for for Trumpism and spending a lot of time in the Gingrich era, et cetera, et cetera, and you know there, there are some arguments there. I, I just think it's different. I think that um, you know it, it, Donald Trump is not in any way a conventional conservative Republican or what they used to call like the movement conservatives. Um, he is all about himself. Um, when he's talking about retribution and he's talking about take, making a war on the deep state, he's talking about making war on people that he views as his enemies, his personal enemies. As you know, in the book, I spend a lot of time talking about the imagery of Waco, Texas as the first, as the location of the first campaign rally and the language, much of it, I think Bannon, um, inspired, of, of, of talking about, you know, rooting out and utterly destroying the people within our government that are our enemies, our domestic enemies, um, the people that are out to get us, the ordinary citizens. This is all the language of the militia movement that we saw in the, in the 1990s that inspired Timothy McVeigh to load up a uh, U-Haul truck through full of, uh, you know, fertilizer and to bomb the, uh, the, the federal building in Oklahoma City. And he did that largely because of the federal overreach uh, that we saw result in 80 plus people dying in Waco, Texas. And here Donald Trump is echoing the same language, except now the complaint isn't, um, you know, that the federal federal authorities vastly screwed up in, you know, when they went after the Branch Davidians, which they did. Um, it's that the federal authorities like are, are coming after classified documents that I pilfered from the White House, um, that I'm being prosecuted for <laughs> paying off a porn star. I mean, it's all him. Th- th- these are not real grievances. But it makes you wonder though, right, John? I mean, you're, you've are you been doing this again a long time. You've traveled the country uh, covering campaigns. You interview people from many different states, lots of swing states. Um, what happened to the country? You know, my my observation uh, was that and I and again, doesn't reflect well on me because I blew up in a blue collar neighborhood. But I feel that I was in an aspirational blue collar neighborhood. My parents thought their kids were going to go to college and live the American dream. When I traveled with Mr. Trump before he was president. So we'll call him Mr. Trump to date it. uh, 71 campaign stops with the Trump plane in and out of places, Rust Belt states, swing states. These people felt economically desperational. They felt like the establishment oh, yeah. had left them out. Oh, yeah. And so yeah. now a result of which he's their last best hope. I guess, I guess what, why can't the establishment see that? Why isn't the established? These are people, John, that voted for Lyndon Johnson or their grandparents or great grandparents yeah. voted for FDR. Why is it that neither party, whether it's my old party, the Republican Party, before this reconfiguration, or the Democrats are not getting what Trump is laying down, which is so obvious now after seven years of observing it. Yeah. And when I say the grievances aren't real, I'm talking about the deep state being out to get you and they're trying yeah, to no, like, the you know, I'm no, talking, I know that. 
I'm talking about that stuff, but yes. but in terms of uh, th- there are a, a hell of a lot of people out there who feel left behind or betrayed by the political system, by Democrats and by Republicans. And yes, these are you know the people that voted Democratic. These are the these are the Democrats that voted for Reagan in 1980. These um, are you know people who look at the vast creation of wealth. Uh, and look at their own lives and see that it's entirely passed them by. And they also see themselves talked down to uh, by elites. Um, they see, you know, and, and, and a lot of it plays into the culture stuff, of course, uh, you know, poor or middle class whites who get blamed for all order of things uh, and, and told that they are privileged uh, because of, 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 of their race. And so it was a, it was very fertile ground for Trump to tap into. And when you were on the plane with him going around in 2016, I mean, I think that a big part of the appeal there was Donald was, was the image that Trump had successfully created for himself, by the way, before he got into politics, long before he got into politics, which I'm the guy, I mean, I'm like the biggest, the richest, the best. I like, I've developed the best thing, the the greatest, the, you know, and I'm going to, I'm going to do it for you now. I'm going to do it for the country. Um, I'm going to bring in the greatest minds. I'm going to bring in the Anthony Scaramucci's. I'm going to I'm going to bring in the top, the ruthless negotiators from Wall Street and I'm going to have them negotiate for our country. I mean it was you know, th- there was never much to it in reality, but the appeal to it was obvious. Um and and then, you know, when Republicans finally got around to kind of criticizing him and taking him on in that primary, uh, you know, for too long, they didn't, they tried to ignore him because they thought he would disappear. You know, one of the first attacks from Marco was, uh, you know, he's, he's, he's a fraud as a business guy. He's not really successful. And, you know, Republican voters looking, wait, you mean the guy that's like given helicopter rides at the, at the Iowa State Fair? You mean the guy that just arrived on his own jet that says Trump on it? And you, you know, Marco, who's like, you know, uh, struggling to pay off your, your college uh, uh, debt, you're saying this guy's not successful? Right. It, it didn't land. And and and, and right. he, you know, that was the appeal. But that that's a very different message than what he's saying now. Don't you think? I I do. I mean, I, this is the thing I don't understand. Like, you know, I obviously friends with Governor Christie. I know he worked at ABC for a while. Uh, I've supported Governor Christie. Full disclosure, I've given money to the PAC, given money to the campaign. I don't know why Chris doesn't say, hey, I understand why he's appealing to you. However, I would like to offer you a different alternative. It's my job to have you not um, unselect Trump, but to pr- put me in the number one position versus him. He's not doing that. He's bashing Trump all day. And when when you bash Trump to that 15 percent of the people, they feel like you're bashing them. You see what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, you know, and, and, exactly. And in fact, and, and I think that's a mistake Chris is making. But, you know, that's the campaign that he wants to run. Um, you are saying something else, which I find super fascinating. Uh, And I want you to explain this to our viewers and listeners. Uh, You say that Trump is undercovered. And and I actually think it's true. He has the smallest campaign staff of any front runner in history, yet he's still dominant. Uh, Tell us what you mean by that statement and why it matters. After he left the White House, first of all, he's off Twitter. Um, You know, Fox for for a long period seemed to almost pretend like he didn't exist. He certainly wasn't being interviewed. Um, the way he was covered in much of the rest of the, you know, I mean, I, I hate to talk about the media as, as one big monolith, but, but by many news organizations mm-hmm. uh, was, was at first to cover the impeachment trial, which was not covering, you know, him per se. It was, it was covering the, 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 the prosecution of, of what he had done and his culpability for January 6th. Go forward into the following year, and there's there's coverage of the formation of the January 6th committee, the January 6th committee's uh, uh, hearings, and then eventually the, the the criminal prosecutions. These things get covered a lot. I'm not saying that there's not coverage of that, but what there's been very little coverage of, I think, until recently, and hopefully my book has helped spur some of this, is what's the guy actually been doing since he left the White House? What, who's, who's around him anymore and what are they talking about? What is he, you know, what would he actually be like if he came back to the white house? No, there's like coverage of the civil case against his business where he, he, again, today he was there and, 
you know, sitting in court. Um, you know, what, what's Jack Smith's latest thing, but, but what, so that's why I tried to dive into the guy's mindset. And what I found was a deeply, uh, uh, paranoid and, uh, uh, conspiracy minded, uh, individual, uh, who looked nothing like even a former president or a potential future president looked like somebody that was stuck in this world of the far fringe, um, believing some of the most wacky, uh, conspiracy theories and surrounded by an almost entirely, you know, people that are total sycophants who are there mm-hmm. just to tell him how great he is. See, it's interesting because I, I, I know a lot of the people on his campaign. I get I'm interested in your reaction. It's a small group, but there's some talented people. Th- 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 there are. Yeah, th- there and are. That, and that scares me, by the way, because it's not just sycophants. These are uh, deep state, uh, delayering the administrative yep. state, expansion of executive power, uh, but effective and smart you, people. You know, these are like, uh, less crazy people than Bannon, but equally targeted, if that makes it's, any sense. It's it, it's fascinating. You, you have kind of two groups of people. You have the people that I just described, the kind of yep. like way out mm-hmm. there, um, yep. uh, you know, veterans of uh, OAN, you know, One American mm-hmm. News, uh, yes. um, mm-hmm. you know, yep. and, and, and by the way, Bannon as well. Bannon's not actually on the campaign, but Bannon, I think, is a... Mm-hmm. Very much a a, 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 a a an influence, maybe even more important than he was uh, going into uh, twenty sixteen and twenty seventeen, um, because it's Bannon's agenda. It really is, insofar as there is an agenda besides I want to go and kill all my enemies. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But then you have this very small group of operatives, and you know who they are. It's people yep. like Susie Wiles, Chris mm-hmm. Lasavita, Brian Jack, Jason, Jason Miller. Miller. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and by the way. That's kind of it, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I mean, it's a really small group. But they're talented, John. You, you they, and I they, both they know are, they are people. absolutely talented, and, and you know they're effective. And 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 there, it's a smaller group than was around him even in 2016, which was a very small uh, right. campaign. But and and by the way, there's one strength they have over 2016, and that is they aren't trying to kill each other. There's right. no infighting that you hear of coming out of the. I mean, they they they, they are on the agenda. They're doing their things. And they've 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 already been methodically going through uh, trying to game out the primary system, trying to influence the rules in each of the primary states uh, to to Trump's benefit. They've done this in Nevada, where you have this weird system where there's going to be a caucus that's actually going to award the delegates and a primary where people are going to vote. Um, all the states that are becoming winner take all because Trump knows they mm-hmm. know they believe Trump c- can get 35, 40 percent. Uh, and and come in first place, and they don't mm-hmm. want anybody else getting pieces of delegates for coming in second or third. Um, so yes, they they are, but but you know th- these are these are not actually the people that Trump is spending most of his day with. Um, he is um, one actually. Th- 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 there's another factor, and I- I'd like your thoughts on this too. Mm-hmm. But th- this was something that was pointed out to me uh, by somebody who was there then and is not on the campaign now, but is still in that orbit and still very sympathetic to, uh, you know, still much on very much on the Trump team, um, pointing out that, you know, he never really, he didn't play much golf in, uh, in 2016. He still plays golf like almost every day yeah. and he's doing, you know, a campaign rally every once in a while. I mean, he started to step right. it up a little bit, but he has spent more time since the beginning of October sitting in that courtroom in New York mm-hmm. on the civil trial against yep. his company than he has at actual campaign rallies. I mean, oh, he was I mean, working it when you were, I mean, you just described yeah, all well, the he, events. He was were. working it, but he wasn't a former president and he doesn't, yep. he's currying the sympathy from these hard right yep. conspiracy theorists that think this is a witch hunt. They leave out that Mark Meadows, who was an arch conservative and a member of the Freedom Caucus or the founder of it, frankly, uh, is coming after him now too. All right. Well, I, I, uh, you've been very generous with your time. I have five words I always present to my authors before I allow them to depart. And so you can react to these words any way you'd like, a sentence, a word, okay. uh, just sort of a Russia test here. I'm going to start with the word Republican. Troubled. Troubled. Okay. Democrat. 
troubled. I'm, I'm sorry. I might have yeah. to. Yeah. Uh, I actually think the best thing the Republicans yeah. have going for them are the, the Democrats. Democrats. By the yeah. Way. D- Democrats okay. are, I mean, we, we haven't talked about that. Democrats have, right. yeah. Yeah. Right. They've squandered this opportunity to be a sure generational, have. a Rooseveltian generational force. Uh, 2016. Uh, a, a, a black swan event, um, a, something that was nearly impossible to anticipate. Right. Um, and, right. um, something highly unlikely to be replicated. 2024. Everything is at stake. I mean, and, and, and Anthony, <laughs> I've, um, been covering presidential elections. I've, I've, I've had the great privilege to have been covering presidential elections in one way or another since 1992. And every time you see people come out, this is the most important election of our lifetime. Well, guess what? This one actually is. Right. Well, it feels that way to me. I say the yeah. word Trump, you think of what? I, 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 I think of betrayal. Mm-hmm. Uh, because I, and and I I don't yeah. I can't quite comprehend the one thing I can't really comprehend is how somebody could set out to destroy the way he has the very system that made it possible for him to become president of the United States right and the and the system that made his parents and everyone so on and so forth very successful yes I mean it's um, why would you do that this is this is I the greatest country in the world and it has served you beyond your wildest dreams. And, Jonathan, you know. Jonathan Carl, last question. You ready? Are yeah. the Mets going to make the playoffs next year? I didn't say win the World Series. Are they going to make the playoffs? Uh, I, I'm, I'm always an optimist. I'm going to say yes. Oh, you're one of yes. those type of Mets fans. Okay. Yes, yes. All right. And title, great to be with you. Great to be with you. And by the way, my yeah. daughter Anna was, was, was in the room when you had your once one glorious live press conference yeah. in that briefing room. Yeah. And she was there uh, the day uh, you were you were hired because she was she was kind of shadowing me. That just happened to be for a week, so she was right. there for you know for two thirds uh, at least my whole of federal career. You see that? I mean, I mean, my God! And 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 she got she was with me during that day, your first day on the job, where Sean Spicer slammed the door in my face twice, once yeah. in the morning. And once in the evening, yeah. both times, my daughter was right by my side. So yeah, he wasn't happy with me, Sean. But Reince yeah. wasn't happy with me either. You know, he he still <laughs> runs for me. You know, uh, you'll enjoy this story. The Wall Street Journal had a picture of me and Reince in a stare down in the Oval Office on the front page. Yeah. Well, the journalist won some kind of reward, the photographer. So he sent me the the picture to uh, autograph. So of course I did. You know, it's sort of like Ralph Branca. And Bobby Thompson with the yeah. home run, you know what I mean? Or yeah, Mookie yeah. Wilson and Bill Bruckner, yeah, right? Right, right. But yeah. Rice, is, Rice is such a baby, he wouldn't sign the picture. You come know, on, Rice. Oh, sign come the on. picture. Come on. You know, he's such a baby. But as I've said to Rice and Bannon, anytime you guys want to share a stage with me, uh, any place, anywhere, you pick the moderator, uh, we could have a little tangle together, you know? Well, let's do that. I'll be the moderator. Just offer uh, it up. Say, I volunteer. Hey, hey, the, let's do it. Hey, the let's mooch is available. If you want to. By the way, Bannon the would do it in a heartbeat. He Bannon won't. will do it in a heartbeat. He will not so. do it. He will not do it. I've offered. Really? I even offered. I even offered to pay him at the SALT conference. If you want to try him again on the future okay. of the democracy and the country, uh, you, me, and him, and we can do it any in any venue that he wants, uh, that would be a lot of fun. Okay. You wrote a I mean, hell of a I'll, book. I'll, and thank you for leaving my name out of this book this time, Jonathan Carl. Hey, you were in there uh, enough before, man. <laughs> right. But you know, you know I'm a good sport. And uh, you yeah. can't go into politics without taking a beating. And so I'm all good. And uh, I appreciate you coming on today. And I appreciate our friendship. And, and thank you for joining us at Open Book. Great. Thank you. Take care. Thanks.